Hello and welcome to another episode of A Brief History. Today's episode, Sonic the Hedgehog. Ready, set, go. August 14th, 1989. Having spent the better half of a decade releasing groundbreaking game after groundbreaking game, it was clear that the gaming market basically belonged to the juggernaut that was Nintendo. However, that's not to say that they were entirely without competition. There were a number of consoles released in the 1980s attempting to grab the spotlight from the Mario machine. These included the likes of the Atari 7800 and of course the Sega Master System. However, despite the Master System impressive success in the PAL regions, history has kind of forgotten Sega's 8-bit effort for a number of reasons. For one, it was attempting to outdo Mario, Zelda, Metroid, and Mega Man with Alex Kidd, Fantasy Star, and a janky looking port of the original King's Quest. And those weren't bad games, but really in the end, they were just completely outmatched. But perhaps the true reason that the Master System is overlooked these days is probably due to Sega themselves. You see, by the end of the 8-bit era, Sega were determined to forge their place as a true competitor in the gaming market. So as the 80s crawled closer to the 90s and gaming inched closer to its fourth generation of consoles, Sega were able to get a leg up on the pile, edging out Nintendo in the race towards the 16-bit era with the release of the now classic Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive in <coughs> Europe, whatever. This new system boasted some of the most advanced graphics ever seen on a home console at that point, as well as a lineup of games that aimed to appeal to a slightly older demographic than that of Nintendo. A prime example of this was the original Genesis pack-in game, Altered Beast. A side-scrolling arcade beat-em-up featuring ancient Greek burial grounds, zombies, and a main character who can transform into all sorts of powerful monsters. And I mean, look at this. As silly as this may look now, think about when this came out. If you wanted this kind of thing on NES, you'd have to go to the store and seek out something like Castlevania. But on Genesis, this was how they came out of the gate. However, as unique of an approach as this was, it unfortunately only brought the Genesis moderate success. Well, except in Europe, actually. It was pretty much super popular from the get-go there. But nonetheless, Sega knew that if they wanted to take the throne of the gaming market, they'd have to overthrow the king. Yes, Sega were now tackling the issue head-on, developing a new game and new mascot to compete directly with Nintendo's head honcho, Super Mario. And the result of these efforts culminated on June 23rd, 1991, with the release of the Sega Genesis exclusive Sonic the Hedgehog. Heavily inspired by the 8-bit platformers it was aiming to compete with, Sonic the Hedgehog acted as somewhat of an antithesis to the reputation that the Genesis built for itself upon launch. Where the previously mentioned Altered Beast was dark and ominous, Sonic the Hedgehog was arguably the most vibrant and colorful platformer of its time. In this game, we assume the role of Sonic, an anthropomorphic blue hedgehog with some sweet kicks, as he runs and jumps through a wide variety of worlds, or zones in this case, all in his efforts to save a bunch of cute animals from being transformed into heartless robots by the evil Dr. Robotnik. And this simple gameplay setup and equally simple storyline were wrapped up perfectly with some of the most detailed visuals ever seen in a home console game at that time. But 16-bit graphics aside, being bright and colorful wasn't anything new at all for platformers. But what made Sonic truly stand out among the hundreds of platformers that came before it was its emphasis on speed. You see, back in the NES days, save files were a pretty uncommon thing. So every time someone turned on a game like Super Mario Brothers, they were required to play through the first levels in order to make any progress, often leading them to having memorized the levels and attempting to speed through them as fast as they could just to get them over with. And programmer Yuji Naka took this concept and implemented it into various elements of Sonic the Hedgehog's mechanics and design. Rather than having the player gain speed by pressing a run button, Sonic gained speed simply by running forward and gaining momentum over time. And on top of this, most levels featured multiple pathways for the player to take, rewarding those who could make it to the higher, more speed-heavy path, while punishing players who kept screwing up with lower paths filled with enemies, spikes, and other variables obstacles. And it was this speed-based design, mixed with Sonic's mischievous demeanor and the advanced processing power of the Genesis itself, that skyrocketed both the game and its console to the forefront of the gaming industry. Once Sega replaced Altered Beast with Sonic as the Genesis pack-in game, there was no going back. This is why the Master System isn't talked about much today. Its little brother, the Genesis, was a powerhouse that released to very little competition. The Super Nintendo and its 16-bit Mario launch title were still months away, leaving Sonic and Sega just enough time to establish themselves as a true force to be reckoned with in the gaming market. A position they aim to maintain by keeping their new beloved mascot running. Running. Always running! And over the course of the early 90s, Sonic the Hedgehog saw a wealth of sequels, all of which introduced new mechanics and new characters to the series. These included Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Sonic CD, Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and Sonic and Knuckles, which were released in 1992, 1993, 1994, and 1994, respectively. Sonic 2 introduced a side character named Tails, as well as the now classic Spin Dash move, which allowed the player to quickly gain momentum and speed off in a blue ball that would destroy any enemies in its path. Sonic CD 
was an exclusive release for the Genesis add-on known as the Sega CD, and introduced a time travel mechanic as well as the now series staple characters Amy Rose and Metal Sonic. And lastly, Sonic 3 and Sonic and Knuckles and Knuckles and Knuckles and Knuckles and Knuckles and Knuckles and Knuckles. Okay, so Sonic 3 introduced yet another new character named Knuckles, and Sonic and Knuckles made this new character playable, even giving him his own unique abilities. However, these were not originally meant to be separate games. Originally, they were going to be one big game, but due to financial and time restraints, the game was split up into two releases. However, the full original Sonic 3 experience was still able to see the light of day, for Sonic and Knuckles was both a standalone game and an expansion cart. Plugging the Sonic 3 cart into the Sonic and Knuckles cart unlocked Knuckles as a playable character in what was then awkwardly known as Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles, a practice which also worked with Sonic 2. And on top of these sequels, the early 90s saw an even greater amount of Sonic spin-off games. Between 1991 and 1996, the world was graced with over a dozen different Sonic spin-off games released for pretty much every Sega console on the market at the time. These included everything from pinball games and racing games to puzzle games and even 8-bit versions of Sonic 1 and 2. So after only 5 years on the market, the Sonic the Hedgehog series already had enough critically acclaimed games under its belt to make any red-clad plumbers turn their head. And almost all of these games saw a number of ports to other consoles over the years. Some great, and others, well... That's no good. But by this point, it was 1996, and the 16-bit era that brought Sonic his fame was kinda on its way out. A new generation was being ushered in that ditched detailed 2D pixels in favor of the brave new world of 3D polygons. In fact, Sega's own introduction to the 3D console world, the Sega Saturn, had already been out for a year, so the gaming landscape was suddenly very different. Mario had already made his jump to 3D, and new guys were springing up left and right, pioneering the platformer's shift into the new dimension, including Crash Bandicoot and Sega's own bugs. So Sega's Sonic team were now faced with the question of how to bring their namesake mascot into 3D. They, along with developers Traveler's Tales, tried a couple of different approaches over the next few years, including the likes of Sonic 3D Blast and Sonic R. Released for both Sega Genesis and Sega Saturn in 1996, Sonic 3D Blast attempted a pseudo-3D isometric viewpoint, but was pretty heavily marred by slippery controls and its more maze-like level design. Whereas Sonic R, released in 1997 for Sega Saturn, was a fully 3D racing game that was pretty well received upon release, but has kind of been critically panned in retrospect. So yeah, neither of these games really brought the Sonic the Hedgehog formula into 3D, but Sonic Team still had one more ace up their sleeve when it came to bringing Sonic into the next dimension, and that project was known as Sonic Extreme. Yeah, apparently Sega actually had another fully 3D Sonic game planned for the Sega Saturn that never saw the light of day. It kinda looked like Bug, except through a fisheye lens, and as interesting as it probably would've been, the project was ultimately cancelled after several development issues and negative reception from Sega higher-ups. So without a new exclusive Sonic game to its name, the Sega Saturn failed pretty hard, but Sega were not done. Having learned their lesson from the Saturn, Sega came far better prepared with the release of their next home console, the Dreamcast. At the forefront of the system's launch library was the first truly 3D Sonic the Hedgehog game, Sonic Adventure. Released on September 9th, 1999, Sonic Adventure was an action-adventure game in which players could assume the roles of Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy, as well as series newcomers E-102 Gamma and Big the Cat. Each of these characters came with their own story campaign and unique gameplay setup that ranged from high-speed 3D platforming to <laughs> fishing. However, retcon-worthy characters aside, Sonic Adventure was a pretty massive hit, going on to become the best-selling game on the Dreamcast and spawning two critically acclaimed sequels. Yes, I said two sequels. I did not mess up. Of course, most of you are probably aware of the immensely successful Sonic Adventure 2, but prior to that game's release, Sega actually teamed up with the company SNK to release Sonic the Hedgehog Pocket Adventure, a classically styled 2D platformer exclusive to the Neo Geo Pocket Color, marking Sonic first release on a non-Sega-owned console. A practice that would unfortunately soon become very common, as the Dreamcast just could not stay afloat in a market which now boasted the PlayStation 2 and Xbox as primary competitors. And the console was discontinued shortly after the release of Sonic Adventure 2. Following this early retirement, Sega decided to get out of the console market and focus more on third-party development, leading to both Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 seeing ports to, of all things, the Nintendo GameCube. Yeah, Sonic games released on a Nintendo console. Back in the day, that was a pretty Pretty big deal. Unfortunately, ever since going multi-platform, Sonic's been a little all over the place, at least in terms of his home console adventures. In the handheld market, Sonic's been keeping things mostly old school ever since 2002, thanks to the Sonic Advance trilogy, the Sonic Rush games, and even Sonic Rivals. There were a few experiments here and there, like the Game Boy Advance Smash Bros. clone Sonic Battle and the Nintendo DS exclusive Bioware RPG Sonic Chronicles, but for the most part, Sonic's adventures on handheld consoles were mainly 2D platformers akin to the original Genesis games. Home console releases on the other hand, again, 
Oh boy. Throughout most of the 2000s, it honestly seemed like Sonic Team weren't quite sure what they wanted to do with their series. And thus, they began experimenting with all different kinds of gameplay. You had 2004's Sonic Heroes, which revolved around team-based gameplay, and then there was 2005's Shadow the Hedgehog, an attempt to make the Sonic series more edgy through the perplexing introduction of guns. So many guns. And the series got so crazy with experimentation that Sega just decided to scrap everything and reboot the entire Sonic series in celebration of Sonic's 15th anniversary. And this resulted in the release of the now infamous Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 for the PS3 and Xbox 360. Technically a return to the Sonic Adventure formula at its core, Sonic 06 was a glitch-ridden, unpolished, and flat-out unfinished game that is now pretty universally regarded as one of the worst video games of all time. Seriously, I would go more into it now, but it's a topic that has been thoroughly covered on YouTube plenty of times already, so I'm not gonna repeat too much. Just look at this. This was a product sold for full price. This was how Sega celebrated the 15th anniversary of their most beloved icon. This... Oh, this was just gross. Just, just gross. Come on, man. You're better than that. So yeah, Sonic Team's attempt to reboot and inject new life into the franchise actually almost killed it. Review scores for Sonic 06 averaged out to around 4.5 out of 10, and despite selling well, is viewed as the moment the Sonic series hit rock bottom. And one might think that, at this point, Sonic Team would take a step back, halt production, and maybe think about what they were doing with their series. But that person would be wrong, because that's the exact opposite of what they did. The Sonic series continued to see new releases almost every single year, and I'm not saying that Sonic Team didn't learn from their mistakes, but it's clear that post Sonic 06, they were still having trouble finding their footing. This was evidenced by Sonic Team's very next game, Sonic and the Secret Rings. Developed alongside Sonic 06 and released for the Nintendo Wii on February 20th, 2007, Sonic and the Secret Rings was kind of an on-rails running game similar to Temple Run that placed Sonic in the world of the Arabian Nights. The game received average reviews and went on to see spiritual successors in a couple of Sonic mobile games and even a sequel in 2009, Sonic and the Black Knight. Night, which placed Sonic in the world of King Arthur and gave him a sword. It didn't do that well either. But all was not lost for Sonic fans, for in between these two games, Sega put out what was known as Sonic Unleashed. Released for the PS2, PS3, Xbox 360, and Nintendo Wii in late 2008, this game was broken up into two halves. The first half was fast-paced 3D platforming, where you play as Sonic, and the second half was God of War-styled hack-and-slash action levels in which Sonic took on a werewolf form called the Werehog. So again, it was a bit of a mixed bag, and this was reflected in the game's review scores. But where the Werehog levels were kind of a turnoff for most fans, the daytime platforming platforming level served as an incredibly promising blueprint of what could be done with the new 3D Sonic game if these ideas were expanded on. And for their next few games, that's exactly what Sonic Team did. In fact, Sonic Team spent most of the early 2010s bringing Sonic back to its roots, starting in October of 2010 with Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1. As the name would imply, Sonic 4 was a short 2D side-scrolling throwback to the original Genesis trilogy and was planned to have three episodes released periodically for pretty much all systems available at the time. Unfortunately though, due to reasons unknown, the miniseries never made it past past episode 2. But this game wasn't really the main Sonic event of 2010, oh no, the big release of that year came one month later on November 16th, 2010, and it was known as Sonic Colors for both the Nintendo Wii and Nintendo DS. Now while the DS version was essentially just another Sonic Rush game, the Wii version is regarded by most to be Sonic's true return to form. This game took the traditional platforming levels from Sonic Unleashed, expanded and refined them, and then implemented them into some incredibly creative and beautiful worlds. And on top of this, Colors also introduced new power-ups to the series in the form of small aliens known as Wisps, which would go on to appear in multiple other Sonic games. Upon its release, Sonic Colors was heavily praised for its back-to-basics approach, becoming the most positively reviewed home console Sonic game since Sonic Adventure 2, and going on to sell multiple millions of copies. And it was at this time, following the undeniable success of Colors, that the Sonic series was coming up on its 20th anniversary. Now, we all know how Sonic's last big anniversary went down, so this time around, Sonic Team admittedly played it pretty safe, which was exactly what they needed to do. And in November, of 2011, the world was given Sonic Generations for PS3, Xbox 360, PC, and Nintendo 3DS. Now, the story with this game was pretty much the same as Sonic Colors. The handheld version was essentially just another 2D Sonic Rush game, but the console version was praised as one of Sonic's greatest games in years. Lifting its gameplay formula primarily from Sonic Colors, Sonic Generations was a full celebration of Sonic's entire history. Every level in the game was lifted from any one of Sonic's most notable titles and given new life with a complete HD makeover. 
over. But that wasn't all. Each level was split into a classic Genesis-style 2D act and a modern Sonic Colors-inspired 3D act, meaning classic zones from Sonic's early titles could now be played in 3D and vice versa. Mix all of this with a wealth of Easter eggs and unlockable content, and Sonic Generations was the big anniversary celebration game that Sonic 06 only dreamed it could be. And this was evidenced by the game's reception. While the 3DS version inspired a pretty mixed response, review scores for the console version were on par with the very well-received Sonic Colors. And overall, Sonic Generations sold just as well, if not better, than its predecessor. So by this point, the Sonic series had finally crawled itself out of the hole it fell into back when Sonic 06 was released. Both critical and fan opinion of the Sonic series was turning around, and fans were elated to see the series back on track. And with Sonic's return to the spotlight, a deal was struck between Sega and Nintendo for the next three Sonic titles to be released exclusively for Nintendo systems. And the first game of this deal was known as Sonic Lost World. Released on October 29th, 2013 for Wii U and 3DS, Sonic Lost World was a weird one. Where one might think that Sonic Team would have stuck to the gameplay formula that worked so well for them in Colors and Generations, Sonic Team instead chose to experiment quite a bit with this new entry into the series. Sonic Lost World seems to draw a heavy amount of influence from the likes of Super Mario Galaxy and for some reason the cancelled Sonic Extreme, with most levels being made up of small planetoids a la Super Mario Galaxy as well as long centrical tubes reminiscent of Sonic Extreme. Although there were plenty of classically styled 2D levels as well. And in addition to the difference in level design, Sonic's controls and mechanics also got a bit of an overhaul, introducing a parkour system and the ever so controversial run button which replaces the staple Sonic mechanic of gradually gaining momentum. And because of all this, Sonic Lost World is perhaps one of the most divisive entries in the entire Sonic franchise, with reviews ranging anywhere from a 4 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10. So yeah, for some people, Sonic Lost World was a huge misstep on the franchise's trek back to glory, and for others, it was a perfectly fine game. And it is worth mentioning that the 3DS version was the first handheld Sonic game to be in full 3D, and the Wii U version later saw a PC port in November of 2015. But overall, Sonic Lost World just left a good chunk of fans confused. And a difference that would soon turn even more sour by the release of Sonic's next game. You see, in October of 2013, it was announced that Sonic Team would be teaming up with the French production company Wii Do to produce the latest in a long line of cartoons based off the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise. This show was to be known as Sonic Boom and would feature newly redesigned versions of Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, Dr. Robotnik, and more. The show premiered on Cartoon Network in November 2014 with a second season currently in the works. But here's where things get messy. As part of their contract with Nintendo, Sega planned to release a set of video games based on the Sonic Boom TV series. But for some odd reason, these projects were not set to be developed by Sonic Team, at least not directly. Rather, these games would be outsourced to other third-party developers under Sonic Team's supervision. And in less than one year following their announcement, the world was given Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric for the Wii U and Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal for the Nintendo 3DS. Now, upon first impressions, these games did show a little bit of promise. With Rise of Lyric having been developed by Big Red Button, a company made up of former Naughty Dog employees, and Shattered Crystal being helmed by Sanzaru Games, the same development company behind Sly Cooper Thieves in Time. However, any potential for Sonic Boom was crushed by the cruel reality that, when it came to the Wii U games, Sega repeated the exact mistake they made with Sonic 06. Where Shattered Crystal on 3DS was cited as just being kind of monotonous and poorly designed, Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric was released in a horrifically unfinished state. The game was littered with bugs, frame rate drops, and game-breaking glitches that only compounded the fact that the game had virtually nothing that characterized the Sonic game. Aside from a few mock speed running segments, which is where those frame rate issues I mentioned come into play, the majority of Rise of Lyric was more of a collectathon action adventure game like Jack and Daxter, except with no real focus. The game featured moments of both 3D and 2D platforming, as well as beat em up action, puzzle solving, action set pieces, top down shooting, and even gauntlet style dungeon crawling. And all of this could be done with any of the four main characters that the game allowed you to switch between at any time. Although at launch, most people probably stuck to playing as Knuckles thanks to an easily exploitable glitch which allowed him to jump infinitely. A tactic which allowed some players to skip hours worth of the game's content. Now a patch was eventually released that fixed a lot of these issues, but the damage was already done. Upon their launch, both Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric and Shattered Crystal were critically panned, with review scores for both games being on par with, if not lower, than those of Sonic 06. So to recap, Sonic 06 nearly killed the Sonic franchise, but it was revitalized with Sonic Colors, only to be pulled right back down again four years later by Sonic Boom. And since then, there hasn't really been much news on what's next for the Sonic franchise, except of course for the inexplicable third Sonic Boom game. Yes, you heard me right, despite the universal hatred garnered by both Rise of Lyric and Shattered Crystal, on June 9th, 2015, Sega announced a third installment to the Sonic Boom series for the Nintendo 3DS, subtitled Fire and Ice. Although, to be fair, it does seem like Sega and Sanzaru games have learned from their mistakes and are aiming to make Fire and Ice a more traditional Sonic experience. Nevertheless, the game is scheduled to
to come out on September 27th, 2016. But aside from Sonic Boom, Fire and Ice, the Sonic series had kept pretty quiet over the last year or so. That is until July 22nd, 2016, when a big show was held to celebrate Sonic's 25th anniversary. During the show, in between the audio problems and the awkward dancing, a couple of big announcements were made. The first of which was a classically styled 2D platforming game called Sonic Mania. Now, a throwback game is nothing really new to the Sonic series, but this game isn't just an extension of Sonic 4 or Sonic Rush. Rather, this game is made to feel like it came straight from the early 1990s, even down to its pixelated art style and character design. And in addition to Sonic Mania, during Sonic's 25th anniversary celebration, a teaser trailer was debuted for Sonic Team's next big AAA 3D Sonic title. And while this trailer showed no gameplay or even a real title, the prominent inclusion of classic Sonic has most assuming that this will be some sort of follow-up to Sonic Generations. Both of these games are scheduled to come out in 2017 and actually have Sonic fans pretty excited. I mean, I'm still waiting for a Sonic 3D Blast 2, but I mean, this is... this is whatever, I guess. Fine. Sonic the Hedgehog began its life as one of the most critically acclaimed video game franchises of its decade. It gave Sega their leg up on Nintendo during the infamous 16-bit console wars of the 1990s, solidifying its place in gaming history in the process. But as the years have gone on, Sonic's reputation has fluctuated greatly, now becoming one of the most polarizing video game franchises of all time. But whether you love it, hate it, or have just become indifferent to it at this point, the overall success of the franchise is undeniable. And while the future of the franchise remains uncertain, that doesn't change the fact that Sonic the Hedgehog is one of the quintessentially classic video game franchises that even 25 years on, and for better or for worse, is still just as relevant as ever. Thanks for watching guys, DFTBA. Hello, hi, thank you so much for watching this episode of A Brief History, I'm Jimmy, and you should totally go check out my video on Sonic Adventure 2 because we talked about Sonic today, and he's pretty great sometimes. Thanks for watching. Uh, you all are great, and have a great day! There's a fly in my room and it's driving me nuts.